السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another video Alright, so let's get started Okay, so uh, There was a change that I did before uh, It was a long time, I, I actually kind of <laughs> um, The thing is, I was preparing for some exams these days That's why this video took a long time to make um and also what's coming next is even harder to me especially as a beginner and trying my best to give you correct information but anyways so this is the actual change that i've done before which is uh one person had two physical devices somehow and so it aired for him and the error was vacant incomplete it was uh i think error code minus five or five i don't remember probably five or something um and when i checked that status code i found that it was vacant incomplete uh, now to fix this i basically took that result stored it in a variable right uh, of type vacant result then here before i check for errors i actually check if that if that result is not equal to is equal to vacant incomplete or not if it's not equal to that that means we're we have to check there is another error other than uh, like error code other than vacating there's another vacate result other than vacate incomplete you know so we can just go through expect even if it's success you know it's success or anything other than vacate incomplete then basically surely we're gonna check for errors or whatever uh, we're gonna check for that result otherwise if it's vacate incomplete well we're just gonna skip that's basically it. We're not going to do any checking because we know that vacating complete. Basically, I'm just ignoring vacating complete completely. Basically, when we have that result, I don't call expect at all. So that's basically it. Um, and that fixes it. Why? Too simply because instead of requesting the whole, all of the physical devices in the user's device, uh, in the user's uh, computer, what I'm doing, I'm only requesting one device. And so when you have more than one device, what happens is that instead of getting VK success, you get VK incomplete. And if you look into the documentation, you're gonna find that VK incomplete is actually a success code. It's not a failure code uh, or failure result, okay? And you can actually, we can actually check that. Let me show you, hold on a second. VK enumerate physical device. I can copy this function. Uh, there we go just copy it to google uh hopefully add the vulcan in the end or at the start or whatever and then you're gonna find some registry spec stuff click on it and there you go you got your documentation right here for this particular function you can go through all of this stuff which is really awesome here's the valid usage uh because of course vulcan doesn't really um check for errors uh, unless if you of course use some validation layers in our case we're using uh, what is it called it's we're using vk config right but uh, which is basically the same but of course vulcan layers cannot really give you everything you know uh, it would help you in something like valid usage but something like return codes for example but yeah um on success this command returns as you can see it's not just vk success in this case it's also can give you vk incomplete but of course this returns code are possible for this particular function okay because in fact there is a lot of results codes right but every function if you go to the documentation you're going to find what are the possible uh result codes of from for that particular function or whatever okay in this case vk success and vk incomplete are possible for this function and if that happens then it is a success code Otherwise, on failure, it can return for you out of host memory, out of device memory, and error initialization failed. And by the way, there is host and device. There is two concepts in uh, in Vulkan which is a really which are really important, which is the host and device. The host is basically your computer, right? Like I mean, uh, the CPU side in some sense, uh, and the system side. And there is the device, uh, which is basically your GPU, for example. Uh, of course, it depends. Uh, sometimes you can ho have the host and the device in the same chip in the case of integrated GPUs or whatever. Uh, but still, uh, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, but basically, there's if you know VRAM, like 
how much memory you have in your dedicated memory you have in your graphics card that's what host memory is okay of course it doesn't have to be dedicated but here i'm just simplifying it okay and device memory uh, well uh, i'm talking of course about the device memory and the host memory is your normal system ram how much memory you have in your system okay lovely stuff all right of course, in the integrated GPUs uh, case, what happens is that your host memory and device memory are shared in some sense. Uh, although they're not ex like they're not completely shared unless if you have some kind of uh, uh, another kind of technology. I think it's called unified memory or something like that. I don't know. I don't remember. Anyways. That's just some information to have you there, but you don't really need that much. Anyway, uh, let's go back. So that's basically it. And also I had one problem is that I forgot to, to change the, uh, the error message. Instead of count, I have to just say physical devices. Um, so yeah, that's basically it. Now we can go back into our thing and let's go to here. Now today we're going to start by our graphics pipeline. Okay. This is going to be a big adventure for sure. All right. So here we have our vertex and index buffer coming in. We still didn't cover, of course, that stuff. But basically, whenever you see a buffer, when you see a buffer, it's just a chunk of memory. And that's basically it. Uh, we don't know really how, what is that memory for. You are the person to define what is it for and how to interpret it. Uh, or you can tell it to some other system or whatever. Uh, but anyways. Uh, so we have here the input assembler here as you can see you just it just takes that vertex at uh, th those chunks of memory and somehow assemble them as you can see to create those uh, those vertices right zero the vertex is zero vertex one vertex two and if you notice it's the order is important um, uh, because it defines something really interesting so in this case it's anti-clockwise okay and anti-clockwise is basically the standard uh front facing shape triangle uh, i mean <laughs> front facing face <laughs> uh triangle so basically uh the thing is you can enable something in your graphics pipeline which basically hides shapes that aren't in view that aren't in front of you that are in fact in the other direction just to save uh you know gpu processing and stuff uh so it's kind of like an optimization in some sense so basically the shapes that like when you when you define vertices in some order like in anti-clockwise it's going to be facing towards you right but if they are the other direction then it's actually going to be facing the other direction. So when it's facing the other direction, you don't have to draw that triangle. Hopefully that makes sense. But anyway, you don't really have to understand all of this right away. Okay. Uh, but in Vulkan actually, and maybe even in OpenGL, yeah, also in OpenGL, you can actually yourself, like you can, you can enable yourself uh, which winding order you want for the triangle. Okay, but the standard is even in mathematics, it's anti-clockwise, not clockwise. Okay, and anti-clockwise basically against the direction of the clock, what they're called, cursors, I think. <laughs> I don't know what to call them. Anyways, vertex shader. Um, here, as you can notice here, the vertex shader have actually, so you basically kind of like write a program, a GPU program that is usually called a shader in some sense right and there's all sorts of uh, shaders shader types or shader kinds uh, for example here we have a vertex shader a vertex shader basically is a gpu program that runs on each and every vertex in your from your input assembler and then it can choose how to transform those vertices in this case for example it looks like it rotated them around of course um use mathematics to do such a such things uh, first of all because that's how you rotate shapes. And second of all, uh, because any operation that you want to do the G in the GPU, it's not as easy as doing it in the CPU because vertex shader can run on all of those vertices at once if your GPU is able to do that and uh, uh, for that particular mesh, okay? Um, 
but in this case we have a really simple shape you know uh, or mesh you can say or whatever uh, like basic geometry so it probably should be able to do such a thing anyways so anyway we have tessellation here tessellation uh, you don't really have to care about this guy but basically you can notice that it takes in the vertices it takes any primitive they're called okay primitive is basically the triangle in this case and it can subdivide it into multiple little triangles and this can be useful for for example in in terrain quality you know um so yes yeah, like you know when in games for example kerbal space program if you know such a game um when you're near the ground the ground have a lot of uh, triangles like this okay it gets subdivided a lot so you can see a much nicer quality but when you actually you know like really far from the ground from a particular patch of the ground what happens is that this subdivisions uh, keeps on decreasing uh, depending on how far you are because you don't need all that quality since the user's view is quite far away to notice any details anyway. So you can use that thing to basically make sure you're not wasting power on some geometry that is really far away um so that's basically it of course there is a lot of other stuff that you can you can go ahead and just uh, like explore but here there we go uh geometry shader now geometry shader you can notice that you can actually add some new ver like new primitives right and maybe even new vertices if i'm not mistaken but basically here you notice that we actually added another triangle a second triangle just using the geometry shader but i don't recommend using geometry shader since it's really not optimized um except for intel and even for intel it's not that big of a deal um i'd rather use something like a mesh shader which is a new thing uh, although I still don't understand it well, but that's basically what they say. They say that mesh shader, uh, like geometry shader, just just don't use it if you can, of course. Um, tessellation. Uh, tessellation is also new. Geometry and this te tessellation are both new, but tessellation at least is is better optimized generally in GPUs than geometry shader. Uh, because while tessellation only works on the stuff that is already there, geometry shader actually adds another vertex and another triangle, etc. Uh, here, the rasterization stage. So you take whatever you got output from the geometry sh stage uh, or shader, and what happens is that, um, like the GPU goes ahead and projects it into this. Um, image of pixels right so these are pixels of course your whole screen is just pixels and each pixel is of a different color so you can see this image that you see right now okay and what happens here is that the data that we have up to the geometry shader in this case is vector uh, which means vector data uh, or vector image or whatever anyways uh, which means that we only have mathematical definitions of our geometry right we don't really have any raster raster uh, image okay and to actually rasterize the vector data well you go through the rasterization stage which takes this geometry data project it into this uh, array of pixels right uh, and basically what happens is that any pixel that is inside that geometry will go black as you can see here and any geometry that is actually hold on a second yeah and any geometry that is uh any pixel that is outside the geometry will go white as you can see this is basically the rasterization stage of course simplified <laughs> but yeah fragment shader now the fragment shader go through every uh, black pixel that is of course inside the the geometry and it goes ahead and it runs each and every pixel on some other gpu program called fragment and that fragment's job is to go through every single pixel every single pixel will run that program and it will get only the x and the y for example well in fact it will get all the data that you that you gave it from the from the vertex shader and the actual geometry shader if you have that and stuff like that uh but just for simplification purpose 
uh, you usually get the X and the Y, the position of the pixel uh, from 0 to 1 uh, for where 0 is right here, 0, 0 in the X and the Y. Here is 1, 1 in the Y, uh, in the X and the Y, right? In position, the coordinates, the Cartesian coordinates, right? So you get some position X and the Y, you have to somehow figure out, uh, like transform that X and the Y to some RGB values, some red, green, and blue, which are the primary colors, right? Uh, basically, color in the screen is composed of three colors, three main primary colors, RGB. If you if you make, mix those lights, the red light, the green light, and the blue light in varying intensities, you can get basically every uh, light that you may imagine. Uh, of course, you'll get more uh, colors, more degrees in colors, uh, as long as how much depth you have in the color. But anyways, in any way. Usually the depth is from is eight bits, which is basically from zero to two hundred fifty five. Okay, uh, so zero from from zero to two hundred fifty five in red, green, and blue, where zero is basically zero, and two hundred fifty five is one point zero. All right. Anyways, so next up is the color blending now. In this case, we're only looking at one triangle, but you can in fact have multiple triangles, all right? And what happens is that you need to decide somehow which triangle will be shown to the screen. Or if in case, for example, in transparency, if one of those triangles is transparent or both of them, then you should decide how you're gonna merge those triangle colors to, to make it look like they're transparent. And how you do that? Well, using color blending. In this case, we have only one triangle, like one, you know, one shape, which there is no intersecting parts, like uh, there is nothing to decide or, you know, which one is should be drawn first. But generally, if your color blending is super simple, What's gonna happen is that the, la the latest thing that is tried to draw will actually show uh, show to the to the user first, you know, on top, because ba basically it's the last thing you have drawn, anyways. So yeah, um, and that's pretty much what we're gonna do. Uh, basically, we're not gonna do anything fancy right now, like for transparency and stuff. For transparency, you have to do all sorts of crazy stuff, like sorting geometry and sorting draw calls or whatever. Anyways, uh, and also configuring the color blending for sure to take into account the alpha. So we talked about RGB, which is red, green, and blue, but we don't talk. We we didn't talk about alpha, which is basically kind of like the opacity or the transparency of certain pixel it's like when you have two pixels and the, the top pixel have some transparency you can see through it and see the pixel that is uh you know like in its bottom in some sense but anyways uh all right so as you can see the input assembler collects the raw vertex data from the buffers you specify and may also use an index buffer to repeat certain elements without having to duplicate the vertex data itself so of course i really recommend you going through this tutorial um it is really extensive which is quite nice you can also look through the comments especially if you have some problem um, but anyways let's go back into our thing let's add a create graphics pipeline okay of course, I'm not, you know, following strictly the tutorial, but there you go. Uh, right, nice stuff. Uh, rendering, renderer, okay. Uh, did I actually was working? Yeah, okay, I was working on this stuff. Let's roll back everything. I don't even remember anything. I was working on it like, like weeks, I think. Uh, actually, not weeks, but I think at least one week, maybe. I don't know. Anyways, I don't remember. Um, render create and we have render destroy. And this is what's nice about having such uh, GitHub stuff that you can just, whenever you make some mistake or you wanna go back, especially when you're making a video, you can easily just go through versions, roll back to the latest changes, etc. But anyways, um, so that's pretty much it. Okay, so in the render create, we're gonna try to create a graphics pipeline. Pipelines. Now the thing is, we need a device, vacate pipeline cache, create info count, create infos, 
allocator and pipelines. All right, so let's grab the device. So uh, state context, right? I do remember my my project structure, so that's nice. <laughs> we don't care about pipeline caches right now, and we only uh, like we're only interested in creating one pipelines for now at least. But we're gonna so we're gonna just choose one create info. Uh, but basically, why it's expecting you to create multiple pipelines because that's usually the case um, in more complex uh, applications. Too simply because of the fact that you need a separate pipeline whenever you need to change something about how the rendering is done, how the graphics pipeline is configured, or uh, of course there's some exceptions that we're gonna see later, but yeah, that's generally the case. And also, most importantly, is that whenever you want to change the shader combinations, um, then you have to actually create another pipeline so like you can create all of those pipelines that you that you need beforehand at the start of the application and then in your loop in your application loop you just reuse each pipeline depending on your use cases anyways so here i only have one pipeline p create infos now let's actually give it a vk pipeline create info okay uh, uh graphics but like great info of course there we go and next up i think we do need the allocator right state uh, context dot a uh, config right dot allocator pipelines uh okay so here we're gonna reference to say pipelines well, in this case, it's just one pipeline, you know, so here we go. Um, and just for the sake of it, let's just say graphics pipeline. Let's call it that. Okay. Let's try to create that new field. And there we go. It created a new VK pipeline for us inside of the structs called graphics pipeline. There you go. Oh, actually, no, no, that's not what I meant. Really? Hold on. Control Z. Let's go back. I forgot. I have to say render. I want to inside the render. Now let's show context, create new field, and there we go. Now we're talking about it. So we have now the first, our first, uh, you know, uh, field in our render, which is the graphics pipeline. Lovely. Okay. Now let's actually configure this graphics pipeline inside of our create info. Let's see. We have all of this crazy stuff that we're going to see. So VK structure type, uh, this is the graphics pipeline create info, right? What we have else, we have the render pass, which is also uh, something that is needed. To, but now let's start with the, uh, let's see. I think I'll start with the shader modules just as the tutorial is doing. Fine. So let's go ahead. So basically we have our uh, basic structure there set up. So let's see what we can do here. So as I said before, you can notice here that we have this uh, frame buffer coordinates and there is normalized device coordinates. Now in my case, my screen is actually 1920 pixels uh, for 720 pixels. And that means I have like 720 um, squares colored squares in this little bit of size you know um and same thing for this side but it's 1920 okay and same thing for this guy okay and there you go and for example this point is actually the pixel 960 514 the x and the y okay and of course the frame buffer coordinates will be uh, like the size of the frame buffer will be hopefully the same as the window Cord, uh size okay uh but anyways so here we have the normalized device coordinates um and the normalized device coordinates it goes from minus one minus one instead of zero zero in the frame buffer and it goes up to one one in in this corner right and of course in the middle you have zero zero here you have actually the half of the size instead of zero zero but in this case as you can see in the normalized device core that's the origin is actually in the middle of the image um if that makes sense or so yeah 
Um, minus one, minus one, one, minus one. All right, lovely stuff, okay. As you can see, vertex zero, vertex one, vertex two, lovely. And by the way, uh, there is a misconception that I had also when I was just starting, uh, especially with OpenGL, not really with Vulkan, um, because I started with OpenGL uh, a, a little bit here. Yeah. Um, which is that vertex is basically just the position of the vertex, but in fact, you are the person to choose what is the data inside the, the vertices and how you're supposed to represent, like how you're supposed to interpret them, right? But in most cases, vertices at least have a position, most cases, right? Uh, but that's not necessarily the case. You could also have, for example, a color. But of course, all of this stuff is actually done uh, by you and is decided by you. But anyway, now here's our first GPU program. It looks like, a, let's see, it looks like a vertex shader because we're using this GL position and we actually have this position as array, etc. But anyways, so here we go. So here we have the version. The latest version currently at the date of recording this video is for 460, like 460. In this case, they're using 450. And here we have an array of positions. Now, normally the positions and all this uh, vertices data, you're going to actually get it from the buffers uh, like that we described before. But in this case, currently, just for simplification purpose, because in fact, creating buffers is not an easy task, at least in Vulkan. In OpenGL is quite simple. That's why they do it. But in Vulkan, you have to, to understand some stuff. So in this case, we're basically just uh, embedding the data into the program itself, just like we usually do in, in something like a C programming or whatever. Um, GL position. So GL position is basically a static variable that is predefined by GLSL and GLSL is basically the language that we're using here. You can use several, several languages for programming the GPU. Um, you can use, for example, G like, of course, high level languages, for example, GLSL and HLSL. These are basically the most popular options. And I don't recommend going any further than these two anyways, uh, at least for now. Uh, the recording of this video, uh, but make like feel free to explore anyways. Uh, but basically, whatever language you are using at the end of the day, you basically compile those at least in 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 Vulkan, you actually have to compile those shaders into spurvy intermediate format, which is kind of like bytecode for the GPU, right? And then not the GPU actually for the driver, really for the driver and then the driver can go ahead and uh, translate that intermediate format into its own uh, GPU bytecode things like because every GPU is made different, you know, have different instruction set it can basically so what, you, what we have, we have that inter with that simple spurvy intermediate format, which can be um, translated by the driver to whatever it wants to do. Okay. That's basically it. Um, so yeah. Now the thing is, for example, in OpenGL, you can even pass in like just, uh, the code, like the source code itself to the driver, and then it's supposed to compile it and stuff. But that is really horrible because each and every driver will have to deal with all that details of actually compiling your your uh, source code etc and you're going to end up with different compilers for each uh, for each driver um which is really a bad thing because for example your shader may work on your machine but not on other people's machine because you haven't uh dealed with with uh the specification right uh, you misunderstood something or maybe there's even a driver bug or something like that in the compound the shaders or whatever um, so basically instead of giving the source code this high level source code you just give the intermediate binary uh, the the bytecode to the driver which is less error prone and you have more control on what's going on but anyways fragment shader now 
course, as I said, there is different kinds of shaders. In this case, in a vertex shader, you have this GL position, which is basically you give it the final uh, position of that vertex in the screen. In this case here, we're saying VEC4, VEC4, and we're giving it positions and index of GL vertex index. Uh, of course, positions is an array. There's three elements inside of it. It's of course a VEC2 array. There is the first vertex, as you can see, 0, 0.0, which is basically in the middle in terms of the x-axis. In the y-axis, it's minus 0 0.5, minus 0 0.5, which is basically in top, right, in terms of the y-axis. So basically, we have the middle. There we go. This is the x, the middle. Then the y is basically minus 0 0.5, which is in this position, right, uh, which is basically the case here. Right, lovely. Uh, the the second vertex, which is V1, it's going to be here, which is 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So instead of doing 1.1, 1 .1, we're just saying 0 0.5, 0 0.5. You can choose whatever positions you want. They're just going to be, they just should be in the correct order. Uh, of course, that depends on how you uh, configure your, uh, your graphics pipeline, as we're going to see later. Of course, in the fixed functions, I think. Um, VIC2, minus 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So in the x-axis, you have minus 0 0.5. In the y-axis, you have 0 0.5. Okay. Here, I'm actually indexing the array with the GL vertex index. Now, later on, we're going to say to the GPU to draw uh, a certain number of vertices, right? And what's going to happen every every shader that's going to run on some vertex it's going to give us this vertex index for example in this case uh this vertex will be zero this vertex will be one like uh, but in fact this is not really the case this is not a good way to do of interpreting it but basically you have three draw calls okay for each vertex and for so the first draw call will have the gl vertex index of zero the second draw call I'll have the G well not a draw call. <laughs> anyway, I'm not trying to be technical here. I actually go lost. I, I lost in the the details of technical explanation, but <laughs> I'm just trying as much as possible to simplify, it, but you know my brain goes in the way. No bro, this is not exactly this is this is not exactly correct. <laughs> okay, um but basically you have three vertices, right? Here you're gonna have zero, one, two, and depending on which vertex we are considered, we are trying to process, we're gonna actually access a different uh, data. Okay, and that's basically what happens here. Now the problem is here we're trying to make a vector four, right? But here we're passing a vector two. So how that works? Well, of course, we're passing in uh, two extra parameters to fill in the whole vec four because here we're passing in two values by vec2 and then we're passing in two extra values and this may seem uh, kind of weird uh, but this is kind of called like ver ver vectors are quite nice like uh, flexible in glsl which is really lovely i think it's called vector swizzling i'm not exactly sure um but basically, there's a lot of stuff about vectors, which is quite lovely, which makes everything much easier to deal with. So, yeah. But that's basically it. In this case, we're basically passing these one of these guys to the GL position directly. Of course, adding in 0, 0.0 for the Z axis and 1.0 for the W. The W is not really a position. It's just something that the like... That is relevant to how matrices work and how 3D works that we don't have to actually care about right now to set it to 1.0. And for now, since we're not working with 3D, we're just going to 0, 0 for the Z. Okay, fragment shader. Because in fact, GPUs are 3D processors, okay? Uh, they're not like 2D, okay? So if you want 2D, you just have to say for the Z axis 0. That's basically it. Anyways, fragment shader. Okay, so as I said, this this program right here actually should go ahead and be executed for each and every pixel. Well, it's not entirely correct to say each and every pixel because it's actually each and every fragment, right? <laughs> uh, and then you blend all of those fragments into one pixel, okay? Because in fact, you may have multiple triangles drawing 
uh, processing into the same pixel, right? And then the blending stage, the color blending stage actually decides which fragments uh, should be drawn or at least how it contributes to the lay the, to the to the to the final pixel color right but again for the simplification process you can think about it just as every pixel it goes ahead and and colors it okay all right nice stuff and of course by the way i forgot to to mention that the main function is basically kind of like the entry point to each and every of these guys so the gpu actually goes ahead the first thing that it runs is the main function then you can basically make other functions that calls into them or whatever but basically this is the entry point of course you can actually change the entry point and i don't recommend you to uh, at least for the simple case but anyways uh here we have the layout location equal to zero out vec4 out color now the thing is you can have multiple outputs in your fragment shader and in fact even in your vertex shader or any shader I think uh, but basically in this case we have one output at the location of it you can think about it as the array index you know it's like it's zero in this case so we could have several frame buffers that we're actually outputting into but here we're choosing the frame buffer that is uh, binded into the into the shader by zero by the index zero out as you can see you have have this keyboard key keyword out the location of course to tell it which index were which frame buffer we're interested into of course layout uh, it's a function array out here the type is vec4 the red green blue and alpha that's why we have four values and that's why we have vec4 and of course we're calling it here out color okay out color here we're setting the output color in this case we're not taking into consideration any x and y you know whatever uh, because in fact we're not even out inputting it from the vertex shader in this case uh, but in this case here we're just giving it a constant color value okay 1.0 0 .0, 0.0 0.0 so 1.0 for the red which means full red 100% red um, 0, 0.0 for the green 0, 0.0 for the blue and 1.0 for the alphas uh, for the yeah for the alpha so it's basically fully opaque there's no transparency involved and just leave as this because if you want to handle uh, alpha you have to do some uh, special stuff with how you configure the, the pipeline and also how you configure your blending stuff um, anyways Per vertex colors, making the entire triangle red is not very interesting. So of course, this program that we have currently, and like the fragment and this um, vertex shader, will basically give us one color for all the pixels inside the ver inside the triangles, just like this, right? All red. Okay, nice. Now, if we want, each vertex could have its own color. Okay, and that's where. I can show you that you could have multiple data for each vertex. So vertex is not just position. You could have any kind of data and how much you want. Okay, as long as of course the GPU, the device, um, allows you to. Okay, um, in this case we could have, as you can see, we have another uh, array called colors. There is big threes this time okay instead of vic twos because we have here r red green and blue so notice for the first vertex we gave it the red color and no blue no green there you go the second vertex we gave it uh green no red no blue the third vertex we gave it blue no green no red okay lovely now here where this is stored this is stored for each vertex and that's why for now we're embedding it into the vertex shader okay uh, uh by by the side of the positions array right so here uh what we're doing here we're actually making another variable uh called out this is an output from the vertex shader to whatever shader stage comes next which could be the geometry shader, could be the tessellation shaders, could be both, 
could be the vertex shader directly depending on how you set up your shader stages but usually you're gonna have only one like vertex shader and fragment shader Fra vertex shader basically outputs directly to the fragment shader this is the usual case and this is gonna be the case for us right now okay so here we're we're choosing the first location for the outputting to output a frag color uh, some kind of color which is of of type vic3 which is going to be vic, uh, r g and b okay here and here for each vertex we're setting the frag color this uh, output that we have that we made for the colors sla uh, like index of gl vertex index the same thing we've done with positions but this time with colors okay next we add a matching input in the fragment shader now here uh, we since we declared an output in the vertex shader we have to declare an input in the ver uh, in the fragment shader uh, and of course like what makes these things uh, bind to each other like what makes a, an output bind to an input is the location it doesn't really care about what you name your variables it doesn't really care or it cares about location so here you can notice that here output here input but the location should hopefully be the same exact same i don't care about the naming even if it's different doesn't matter okay but what should be the same is the location and here should you should have input and the other one you should have output and what we're saying here out color uh, which is basically the the thing that i described before which is the the final color of your fragment is called is equal to vec4 here we give it the frag color. So instead of giving it this constant values, uh, this three constant values, we're giving it vic3 uh, frag color that we passed from the vertex shader. And for the alpha, we're just setting it, we're hard coding it into 1.0. It's basically a constant. We could, of course, make this vic4s, right? And pass in also the alpha. But in this case, for this sake of this example, we don't care about alpha being variable for each vertex. Um, so <laughs> yeah. And notice you could have like one question, which is that location is equal to zero for frag color, but also for out color, it's also location zero. So how that works? So how does it know which one which? But the thing is, this guy is an output variable, like output uh, variable, right? And this guy is an input variable. Now the input and the output have different indexes, right? It doesn't have the same uh, index. And that's basically it. And you could think about this kind of things like bindings. Uh, output input stuff just like the USB <laughs> port so the USB port is the input right and the zero tells you which USB port you're talking about is it the first one the second one or the third like port and the and that's basically for the output this is and the output is basically kind of like the the USB port that you're talking about you're creating kind of like a USB port and in your other shader stages that comes next you can you can actually bind stuff to that usb port you can uh, plug in for example your usb you can plug in your um disk or whatever using a usb and of course you should make sure if you want to plug into that one particularly you have to make sure that the location is the same it's the same usb port that you're talking about all right lovely stuff Anyways, so hopefully that makes sense. If there is any questions, let me know in the description below. Um, so that's pretty much it, hopefully, right? Compounded shaders. And uh, up to this point, you've only seen one static variable that is actually defined in the language itself, I think, uh, which is GL position. All right. As you can see, shader of frag. So this is the final code. As you can notice here, create a compile.bat file. All right. Now, of course, next, after you actually uh, write your shader source code, what you and source code is basically just normal text. It's not even, it's, it's not even like, you, of course, you cannot write it like, for example, in, in Word, Microsoft Word or something like that. No, uh, I have to be simple. I think even ASCII text, I'm not exactly sure if it should be 
uh, ASCII, but yeah. So basically it's simple text data. And then you go ahead, you feed it into a program called GS GLSLC, or in fact, any compiler that could transform your source code into spur V bytecode. In this case, it's using a program called GS GLSLC, which is actually made by Google. Uh, there is another program called the GLSL Lang Validator, which is made by uh, by uh, the group itself that, that made this, the Vulkan specification and also the OpenGL specification for that case. Okay, and but here we're just using GLSLC. Um, GLSLC, here we're passing the, the source code the file that holds the source code of that shader. In this case, it's shader.vert. So here we're changing the extension. It doesn't really matter what extension, you can do whatever extension, but if you use whatever extension, you have to actually add another parameter that indicates which shader stage you're talking about for that particular file. But uh, instead of doing that, you could just uh, make sure to set it as vert if you were talking about vertex and GLSLC will actually go ahead and understand, understand that you're talking about vertex shader just from your extension. Shader.frag, frag for fragments. If you're talking about compute shaders, you're going to go with frag uh, and etc. etc. Each, uh, I think for, I think for geometry shaders, it's geom. So G E O M, but uh, anyways, you can check out the the GLCLC documentation, which is called Shader C, actually I think. But anyway, anyway, here we see in dash O, which is a named parameter uh, for output. It stands for output, and here tell it which file you want to output that spur v bytecode. In this case, we're just saying frag .spv, and this is the extension for spur v bytecode. Okay, lovely stuff. Now, 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 let's see what we have next. Lloyd in the shader. Of course, it's Lloyd in the shader, just like as a normal um, text file looks like. Actually, no, it's it's Lloyd in as binary, binary file. As you can notice here, it's opening the file and basically it's making sure that it's opening in the mode binary and it start reading the file at the end. Why? Too simply because it can simply take the the size because at the end of the at the end of the file because when you actually call tell G in C++ you actually go ahead and take the the current size that you're on. If it if you didn't specify 8 right here, it's going to tell you 0 for the file size because it didn't start at the end. And sure, make sure to actually uh, go in binary because we're not actually reading text. Text, we're actually reading binary. Uh, uh, it's actually kind of the same thing, but just there is a little bit of difference right there. That I'm, I don't want to go any further in details right now. File dot read. You just read the buffer dot data. Okay and you give it the file size and finally close the file when you're done with your file close it and then return the buffer uh, that you have read from that file okay and then you basically read the file and creating shader modules create shader module here we create the shader stage for each and uh, shader module actually first so here s type of course the code size here we give it the how much elements you have in that binary file um so yeah const to int 32t code data here you give it the actual pointer to that data to that buffer and of course make sure that that buffer stays uh it doesn't get deallocated it doesn't go away until you actually have created the shader all the shader pipelines that are that needs this shader module. So as long as this shader module is alive, you want to use it. Make sure that this pointer to this data is still alive. For example, if you use malloc, don't use free until you have created the pipeline successfully. That's what we're going to do next. Uh, but here, I'm just going to go through it. OK, create pipeline. OK, as you can see, creating shader module, lovely. Then, of course, after we are done with that stuff later on, we're going to destroy the shader modules. Shader stage creation. 
shader stage creation now after you create the shader modules uh, for each pipeline you have to create the shader stage for it so in this case we're uh, like we're interested into the stage vertex bit of course you can reuse this shader stage at some time just uh, uh, so yeah anyways here you set in the module and the p name this is the entry point name in this case in our case main and this is usually the case just leave it as main um same thing for the other guy but this time instead of stage uh vertex we're using fragment uh, stage okay lovely stuff and then you say shader stages equal to vert shader stage info frag shader stage info lovely stuff okay so let's actually do that but in my case just for the sake of simplicity so we don't have to to care about reading files and opening files etc in c um and also making sure that the files are always with the executable what we can do we can actually embed those shaders in the source code itself of course this is not a good idea if you want uh you know like because in fact every time you change the shader code you have to recompile the whole program uh, because it is embedded um and also you should make sure to actually compile each time the the shader changes but anyways anyways uh instead of like at runtime, when the application is started, you actually read the file manually. Uh, but this is basically how you do it, at least in C++. I'm going to show you later on how you do it. But right now, we're just going to embed it. And I'm also going to show you how you can embed it, which is lovely. All right. So, so, so. Let's see how we can do this stuff. First of all, we need somehow to actually put our shader code. So I'm going to create a folder called REST where I put all my resources, shaders, meshes, text files, config files, or whatever. Uh, I'm going to call it res. Okay. I'm going to have here a directory for shaders. Okay. And inside shaders, we can have some files. I'm going to create a GL cell shader. I'm going to call it uh, the same thing as they called it though. Vert .sp, vert what do you call it though? Shader.vert? Yeah, shader.vert, right. Nice. Shader.vert. And we also need another guy called shader.frag. Let's go. Okay, nice. Let's start by the vertex shader because that's basically the first guy that get run for the uh, uh, for the graphics pipeline. Okay. So version, I'm going to go with 4.6.0, which is basically the latest version of GLSL that is available currently uh, in the time of recording this video. Okay, GL position, which is the static variable. We're sending it to Vic4 in this case, Vic3 0.0, uh, 1.0. All right, so that's not the case. If you do this, if you use this, you're not going to have any triangle because basically you're setting all the vertices to the 0.0, .0 position. <laughs> um so no let's actually create a array right now so of course as i said usually you would get this data from a from buffers that we're going to show later on when we actually create vertex buffers and stuff like that but right now we're just hard coding it in the actual shader itself okay so let's actually just uh, create vec2 positions uh, array is equal to what equal to a vec2 array open the bracket or whatever it is called all right and then let's make sure i'm driving it right okay so let's say vec2 and the first position is 0, 0.0 comma minus 0. 0.5 is it the case um expression not allowed here what do you mean oh oh sorry yeah, it should be like this, right? Interesting, it's not like C. I think. Weird stuff. Can I actually just do this though?
This seems weird. Wait, what you say, if you say one here? No, it doesn't work like this, looks like. Uh, Vic 2. Oh, man. All right. Oh, oh, I just uh, forgot about the semicolon. Okay, lovely. All right, interesting. Now, the first is 0, 0.0. Next up is minus 0. 0.5. The sun is blinding me right now. You've probably seen me so white, like a holy man in, in movies. Uh, because of the sun. Vic 2 minus 0 0.5. 0 0.5. Uh, okay, lovely stuff. Minus 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. And by the way, for example, in this case, x and the y are the same. What you can do instead of doing it twice, you can just do this, right? 0 0.5, and you're done. Since it's Vic2, it's going to automatically do that for you for each and every element. Okay, lovely. Uh, what's the problem here? Of course, because we ha should say 3. Okay. Because we have 3 positions. Looks like you cannot have that. Okay. Anyways, um... By the way, you can actually download a plugin that will actually show you, like, will highlight for you and help you write in shaders. Uh, you're probably going to find it in a plugin of your IDE for GLSL, basically. Okay. Lovely stuff. Now, just for the sake of alignment, I'm just going to leave it at 0 0.5. Okay. So people cannot go crazy. Uh... Just making sure I don't piss off anyone. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, instead of three, maybe we can actually get rid of that. Right. You can get rid of that and it's going to automatically, from how much elements we have there, it's going to specify that. All right. Same thing for colors. Let's not waste a lot of time for that. It's just Vic3 instead. I'm going to tab it out. I'm going to do, yeah, it's fine. It's already aligned. Cool stuff. Okay, that's basically how it goes. And we don't need this 3 right here. Now here, instead of Vic3, 0, 0.0, which is constant, you're actually going to say positions, GL vertex. Actually, this is also... Uh, not ID, index, actually. I think because this is a, another version, maybe? I don't know. Oh yeah, I need another, I need Z, right? So Z in this case will be 0, 0, we don't care about 3D right now. And looks like it's no longer GL vertex index. I think GL vertex index, if I remember well, it's deprecated. Now you have to actually use GL vertex ID instead. Um, at least that's what I remember uh, for my research. Okay, so lovely stuff. Next up, of course, we should make sure to set the frag color. This is the, the guy that's going to be passed to the uh, to the to the uh, fragment shader, right, from the vertex shader. But by the way, I still didn't actually explain one thing that I actually forgot about. Is yes, we're giving each vertex a color, right, and we're passing it to the shader. But why we have this gradient though? Because basically, by default, uh, all of the properties of the of the sh of the like <laughs> that you pass from the vertex shader to the fragment shader or whatever stage, they get interpolated. Okay, depending. For example, if in fragments, uh, you get a mix of all of the vertices. Now, th this is by default. Of course, you can actually uh, disable that uh, by using. Uh, if I remember well, you add a flat, flat keyword, I think. Let's see. So you add this layout location, blah, 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 blah. 
output make sure in the vertex shader it's output and location zero or whatever location just make sure that whatever location you're using here you also use in your shader.frag but input okay awesome now yeah i i if i remember well you can actually add flat here somewhere basically and then it will actually disable the interpolation we can maybe try it later on we have a triangle uh, but yeah, there we go. And of course, as I said, this is how you actually bind it to the fragment shader. I'm just going to go right ahead into the fragment shader, make sure it's 460, same version. And of course, by the way, if, if this version doesn't work for you, then you can, then you can surely choose uh, some older version and work with it. And for maybe for uh, compatibility, I'm not sure, but I think for program, pro Probability, probability. <laughs> for compatibility, you can use an older version. Okay. So yeah. Now instead of output, we're gonna say input. Th that's basically it. All right. Uh, you just let all of that stuff same thing. All right. And that's basically the thing for that guy. Now we should make sure to actually pass in. Frag color passing from the vertex shader to the fragment shader. I'm gonna say colors. Uh, yeah, it's actually passing the vic four, right? No, it's actually passing a vic three, which is the colors. Okay, we can just say ver colors. Uh, GL vertex ID again, and there you go. Now we're passing it to the vertex shader through the frag color output. Now let's go to shader.frag and we're gonna get you know, our input and use it here. Instead of this guy, we're gonna say frag color. And there you go. Now, as you notice, we're only using GL vertex ID, which is a static variable. It's kind of like predefined. GL position, same thing. And that's basically it. All right. I think we're done, hopefully. Yeah, I think, I think so. Now we're gonna try to compile the shaders. Okay. I'm going to actually compile them instead of SPV. I'm going to try to compile them into uh, headers, uh, C headers. I'm going to see how. So since we're going to be using shader C, let's actually look for the shader C documentation. Um, docs. There we go. As you can see, it's made by Google. There's also GL GLSL Lang validator, which you can use. Uh, as I said, anyways, let's see if there is something about this here. Don't remember where I found the documentation about the. Uh, hmm. Arch Linux, right? I found the documentation inside Arch Linux man page. Okay, inside the man. All right, I'm gonna be back in a second. Alrighty, I'm back, back, back into business. All right. Um, so as I said, we were looking for shader C documentation. Uh, if I remember well, it was in Arch Manuals. Hold on a second. Arch shader C Arch Manuals. It's called Main. Okay. Uh, at least this is where I found it, and I have Arch Linux, so. Uh, GLSLC, command line, GLSLC, HLSLC to spare v compiler with c -Lang compatible arguments. Let's go. And because of this part, this is usually the one that is preferred over uh, uh, GLSL Lang validator for some reason. But anyways, so this is all of this stuff. And what I'm really interested into, and by the way, here's the shader file extensions that I was talking about. So if you use one of these guys, then you should be fine. You don't have to actually sh set the shader stage yourself. Um, but if you don't, you have to actually shed, set the shader stage yourself using this argument right here, dash F shader stage. If I actually look for it, maybe I could find some example here. But basically, basically, for example, if you're talking about vertex, then you, then you basically say it's dash f shader stage dash stage equal to vertex. Of course, before actually giving it the the file, 
Okay, so yeah. Because he, because he can set multiple file, like you can compile multiple files with the same command, but yeah. And anyways, uh, what I'm really interested into right now really is MF, F, M, FMT or is it CFMT? Hold on a second. No, I, I think this is the guy, right? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> So this is the binary. This is what the uh, what it's by default, and what this is what the sh tutorial here used. Now I'm going to show you how you can use this. Is uh, there is number also, which also just gives you a text file with the all of the code, like the byte code inside of it in text format. But there's also the C format, which is basically a C header. As you can see, output spare v binary code as a text file containing C style initializer list. This is just wrapping the output of num options with curly brackets. Example GLCLC C dash FM M F M T equals C main dot ver dash O output file blah 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 blah. Anyways. So this is what I'm looking for. I don't remember if you can actually set the variable name, to be honest. I do remember you can do it with GLSL link validator. Um I don't think you can do it using this guy. I mean, if I variable name, at least in GLSL length validator was called variable name. Hmm. Uh, so it seems like it doesn't exist, but I'm going to show you both how we can use both, I guess. Um, and I'm going to use GLSL length validator, I think. But anyways, um, all right, lovely. Let's go back to dash MFMT. So now let's grab my terminal. If you're on on Arch Linux, you have to say sudo pacman dash s shader c. Or if you already have said sudo pacman dash s Vulcan devil, you may have it already. I don't know, but just make sure you have shader c and Vulcan devil. There we go. Devil like this, not this. Okay. <laughs> All right development which stands for development all right let's go um glslc let's make sure it's there there we go so glslc you give it the file which is in this case rest slash shader slash uh shader dot frag let's start by vert why not and make sure to, to add dash mfmt in fact let's add it before that stuff dash mfmt equal to c all right what if i done that scalar integer expression required did you mean gl vertex index oh my god looks like it is actually gl vertex index but uh this stupid plugin have actually done it wrong i think mm, yeah i think so Let's try it out again. Scalar integer expression required. So I probably have to actually set that stuff, maybe. Hmm. What's going on? In the cloud identify. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right, let's go. So it's compiled right now, but it puts it inside of here. And it called it a dot spv. Okay, and it gave me this initializer thing, right, where I can basically paste it into my code, which is nice. All right, so let's actually do that. Why not? Um. Okay, what's going on here? Uh, oh, okay. Control C, and I can just paste it in my code. Uh, right delete that it not SPV now since I already copied that bytecode. Okay, now inside the main inside my main.c here, uh, I, I mean render. Okay, let's actually just hard code that. So shader, um, vertex, uh, shader source code. Okay, shader vertex source code. What was my naming, by the way? Hold on a second, real quick. Oh yeah, 
Nice. Okay, shader vertex source code is equal to all of this stuff. Oh, why didn't it, it didn't actually copy it all? Okay, let's actually make sure to do that. Oh, mate, why? Copy. Uh, render. All right, there we go. Nice. Make sure to add the semicolon there. And let's make sure to actually make this UN32T. Oh, UN32T pointer. Uh, not pointer looks like. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, like, should be like this, you know, an array, basically. An array of UN32T. Okay. Lovely. And as you can see, I have 375 UN32Ts there. Uh, for the whole thing, lovely. Later on, we're actually not gonna hard code this. We're just gonna load it. But yeah, for now, we're fine with this, and it's also nice to. It's also this way. It's also nice when you don't like when you want to just ship your application without doing anything fancy, and you don't need any other kind of files to get to ship with your uh, executable. For example, if we use the way the application used it, then we have to make sure that shader dot frag and shader dot vert. Uh, SPV files are also included otherwise the application will fail but in this case it will never fail because it's already in the application itself although this would make the executable much bigger but it also actually gives you uh, gives the compiler more options to actually optimize even further somehow if that's possible I don't know but I would uh, think so because you already have everything in place okay so now after this we can actually say you enter to T shader uh, fragment code source code right source actually it's not really source code it just uh, let's just call it code because it's not really source code right yeah 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 okay shader vertex code shader fragment code uh, okay equal to there you go now let me actually do the same thing but with shader.frag okay i think i've i've messed up something once again maybe because we have some errors right there what uh let me check shader.frag real quick <laughs> why well, have done gel position right here it should be frag color oh my god oh uh, i mean out color okay pretty much okay let's actually add the output for out color right out color let's go all right zero make sure it's output this is basically going to output to some kind of uh attachment or some kind of frame buffer right that we're going to see later on about that anyways uh for now make sure to set the out color not the gl position let's make sure to compile this and also the thing about this way is that you can already see what's going on exactly, which is lovely. Oh, by the way, for, fig four, right? Uh, I mean, you can already see the errors while compiling instead of until you run the program. And then that's what's nice about Spur V instead of just uh, embedding your source code like in text format, uh, like in OpenGL and also also, the fact that in OpenGL, you embed your source code, anyone that can actually somehow uh, see the source code, they can already easily extract the, the all your shaders, basically, all your shaders code without any problem, right? And of course, since your source code isn't really filtered and compiled and stuff, it's maybe much bigger, right? Because you have to include all that text data. Well, in SpareV, SpareV is just binary basically uh, i mean if in fact if you look into here in fact spare v is 4.23 kilobyte and these guys are bytes i mean that makes sense since uh yeah the code is much bigger right uh but for complex for complex code i would imagine it's probably the case but I guess, but in this case, looks like the Spur V code is much bigger. Um, but anyways, anyways, 
Um, all right, nice. MFT, MFMT equals C shader dot frag. Okay, let's try again. There we go. Now it's got compiled uh, successfully because I didn't see any error anymore. Let me make sure everything is fine. Now I'm just gonna try to, oh, look at that. This is the fragment shader code. So tiny. Shader fragment code, there we go. You can do the same thing with GLSL link validator. Uh, but to be honest with you, let's just, uh, for now, let's just go with this, I think. All right, pretty cool stuff indeed. Shader fragment code and shader vertex code. Now what I can do basically is I can say uh, P stages equal to here. I should give it all the stages. All right, this is gonna be a shader. I don't actually remember VK pipeline shader stage great info. There we go. So this is gonna be a, a, um, an array of VK pipeline shader stage creates infos, right? So let's see what we got here. Okay, equal to um, VK pipeline shader stage create info. Shader stage create info, there we go. Is it like this? Actually, let's let's just grab this whole thing into its own array variable instead of doing cramming it here. Okay, stages reader stages and basically VK pipeline shader stage create info shader stages right is equal to uh, uh, shader stage create info right shader stage create info there we go vk pipeline shader stage create info there you go and i also of course i need only two stages in this case and there you go lovely now i can actually add my stuff here so I do need to create the shader modules, right? So the module equal to shader module, uh, vertex shader module. Uh -huh. Dot stage is equal to vk shader stage vertex bit in this case. And uh, next up is S type. I completely forgot about that. And there's also P name, which is the name of the entry point, which is of course just main. All right. Next up is just to make it clear, let's actually say const char uh, entry shader entry function name is equal to main. Now I can just say this, I can pass it there. There we go. Um, next up is p next is also specialization info. Uh, but we only care about S type, right? Okay, let's go with S type. Let's make sure that's the case. VK structure type, graphics, uh, shader, stage, okay, info. There you go. I'd like to actually always put the S type first, just as a convention there. Why not? And the module, let's create now the modules. But, but before doing that, let's just make sure to actually do that same thing with the, the second guy. I don't know why I tapped it that much. Okay. There we go. Okay. Now instead of vertex shader module, it's going to be fragment shader module. And here instead of stage vertex bit, it's going to be, oh my God, a fragment bit. Uh, P name, shader, entry, function name. Okay, it's going to be the same. All right, now let's actually create our shader modules. Let's go. Shader modules. Okay. So how do you create shader modules? Okay, let's see. You create shader modules. VK, create shader module. 
and the shader module is just kind of like a wrapper over the code basically you're gonna see how it goes so state context dot device uh vk shader module create info vk shader module create info dot p type s type as always by the way s stands for structure so yeah vk shader type uh shader module create info there we go Next up is the P code. It's a pointer to the code, which is in this case just um, shader fragment code, vertex code in this case. And the, the code size is since we have an array, an actual array embedded, we can just say size of shader vertex code. Of course, you cannot really say this for a, just a pointer. Uh, I can say this. And it's valid just because this is not a pointer. This is an actual array. So this works. But if it's pointer, then you have to, to get your length, your size, your code size from somewhere else, uh, like your file size or something. But anyways, p next is type p code flags. Uh, okay, so this is pretty much all I need, really, in this case. Uh huh. And I think I need more parameters. There we go. I need the allocator, which is basically state config uh, dot allocator. And I need the shader module. Okay. So shader, I called it vertex shader module. Nice. All right, lovely. So let's create that shader vertex shader module. Of course, it's gonna be a, an address to it. And let's create that local variable. There we go. And of course, we got vertex shader module, and we also got a uh, fragment shader module. Of course, the same type, VK shader module. All right. Now, as I said, <laughs> shader modules are just wrappers over code and code size. That's basically it, just kind of like an array in some sense. Uh, but the, the cool thing is that since we're using the VK config, that I'm going to make sure it's uh, running right now. It's going to make sure by using this VK shader, create shader mode, it's going to make sure that uh, you're using some valid stuff. For example, shader vertex uh, code size should be, I think, if I remember well, a multiple of four. All uh, right. Um, so, yeah, anyways, anyways, anyways. Uh, by the way, I forgot about uh, checking this stuff. Okay. What did I call it? Uh, expect i think right expect okay uh ca couldn't create vertex shader module okay all right nice 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 that's the first guy don't need the semicolon anymore uh same thing with gra create graphics pipelines make sure the same thing uh, before we forget couldn't create the graphics pipeline. All right, lovely stuff. Now, there is a rule that I told you before, which is that whenever you create something, you have to destroy it. Now, after creating the graphics pipeline, we can actually delete the shaders, okay? Because, in fact, when you create the shader module, it's not like, you know, the API have gone ahead and uploaded the shader code to the driver. No, I don't think, right? This is just a wrapper, as I said. But when you really don't need the shader module anymore is when you're done with, uh, when you created the pipelines that it uses, uh, that it's used by, okay? So here, after creating my graphics pipeline, I can go ahead, I can say, vacate, destroy a shader module. Okay, uh, state context dot device and shader module. Uh, here I can pass in the vertex shader module and here the allocator. So state allocator config allocator. 
And by the way, you can also destroy the shaders, right? Like in render destroy, but render destroy will only be called when you exit the application basically. But in fact, you can destroy even before exiting the application right away after creating the graphics pipeline. That's why I'm doing it here instead of render destroy. But render destroy, since we need the graphics pipeline for the whole uh, lifetime of the render, in this case at least, um, we're going to destroy it here. So vacate destroy uh, graphics pipeline. Uh, right, no pipeline, destroy pipeline. There we go. You give it again this device, of course, uh, context.device. Then you give it the pipeline, graphics pipeline, I think, or yeah, render dot graphics pipeline. There we go. Lovely. Next up is the allocator. So set config uh, dot allocator. And there we go. There we go. Okay, destroy pipelines, void, all right. So there's no need to check anything, sure. Now I have a problem here with compatible, incompatible pointer types. But before seeing about that, what is this? Okay, let's actually make sure to create the outer shader module first. Mm -hmm. Now instead of vertex, we're just gonna say fragment. Oh, mate, fragment, let's go. Same thing here, there you go. Next up is, I think I'm supposed to actually give it the address maybe? What exactly, hold on, let me see. What's going on here, what's the problem? Uh, oh, oh, I forgot to actually edit this guy. There we go, lovely. All right, nice. Now, I think we're all good to go at this point, right? Shader stages, incompatible pointer types, initializing accounts, VK pipeline, blah, blah, blah. Hmm. I think because shader stages is, a, is an array, but what it's expecting though, it's expecting a pointer. I think I just have to cast it basically to the right thing just because it's an array. So I have to cast it into a pointer instead of an array, maybe. Const VK pipeline shader stage create info shader stages. All right, awesome stuff. Interesting. Now that's basically it, hopefully. And oh, of course, just for the shader stages, of course. Uh, we're probably going to fail to actually create the pipeline right now if we run. Uh, because we still need a lot of other stuff. Couldn't create graphics pipeline. There you go. And we got a big error right there and a lot of validation errors, as you can see. Because we still need a lot of other stuff that we didn't add yet. Uh, oh, interesting stuff. I forgot about the stage count. <laughs> Okay, and P stages, what the problem with P stages though? Hold on a second. Oh yeah, same thing, same problem, okay. So the stage count, I forgot about this. So we have two stages in this case, but instead of doing that, instead of hard coding that, since we have an array, it can just say the size of the shader stages. Although I shouldn't, but this guy should, will give me like how much bytes there is, not how much shader status there is. But if I want how much actual elements there is, I can divide by size of VK pipeline shader stage create info, or I can basically uh, dereference shader stage and get the size of that. Okay. So by dereferencing, I'm getting an object. Okay. And then get a size of that object. And so, yeah, there you go. Nice. And that's how you do it. Okay, now we still, of course, have uh, an error. In fact, if we check that error, maybe. Anyways, uh, let's just continue about the the other stuff that we need. I think. Okay, so we're done with shaders, I suppose, at this point. Okay. Uh huh. Fixed functions. Dynamic state. Okay. So as I said, you have to configure a lot of stuff before. Uh, 
whenever you create a graphics pipeline and whenever you want to change some configuration about that graphics pipeline you have to recreate the whole thing once again or create multiple things where you have each one have a different configuration that you're interested into so you basically uh, ideally you create all of the combinations of the graphics uh, of the configurations that you want of the graphics pipelines okay um, but there is something great which is called dynamic states now there is some things that you can actually change at runtime without actually recreating the whole pipeline so it's like using the same pipeline but you can change some some configurations and those configurations are called dynamic states basically and that's what we're gonna create right now okay and here, as you can see, you basically give it what what the things that are configurable. In this case, it's setting viewport to be configurable and also scissor. So basically, for example, when the uh, when the viewport gets resized, we want to view resize the viewport somehow, then you can basically change the viewport size uh, without without changing the actual whole graphics pipeline without recreating it and you can only do that if you actually set it as a dynamic state while you're reconfiguring while you're configuring the pipeline uh, so yeah let's do that now so let's see the p dynamic states uh-huh and let's actually say dynamic states okay And in fact, it's going to be, let's just create that here in line. It's called dynamic state create info. No, no. Oh, hold on a second. What? Yeah, it is called that. Okay. Uh, dot S type. It's equal to AK pipeline shader. Uh, not shader. Uh, dynamic state. There we go. Next up, we need the P dynamic state count first of all. And we need the other guy, which is, but anyway, let's actually first of all, create the array of dynamic states. So how you do it? Well, pick a pipeline, pipeline, right? Pipeline dynamic states, create info. What? Hold on, no, not dynamic state create info. Uh, Vicky pine pipeline dynamic state. What? Uh, hold on, let me actually see. VK dynamic state, let's go. VK dynamic state, it's called. And you could basically have a lot of that. So dynamic. Ah, oh, mate, what's going on with my typing today? <laughs> dynamic state is equal to... How do you actually create that thing again? There we go. Make sure to add the array thing there, and there you go. Mm -hmm. Now, I need vacay dynamic state. Right? So what's the problem here? Oh, it's it's actually an enum, all right. It's an enum, right. Uh, all right, nice, nice, nice. Dynamic state. We're gonna use viewport and of course we're gonna use dynamic state scissor. If you don't need the scissor, in this case, we really don't need scissor, but I want to actually show you later on how it works. Uh, like what scissor is for. It's quite an interesting tool. Um, but uh, yeah, anyways, I'll just follow the tutorial in this one. Dynamic states, uh -huh. size of dynamic states divided by size of and 
I'm going to use the same technique once again to get how much elements there is there in the dynamic states. And P dynamic states, I'm going to pass my dynamic states uh, uh, array. And there we go. Although this is kind of confusing, like why it needed to be constant though? Hmm. So yeah, I needed to cast this, but I didn't need to cast this for some reason. Anyways, I may have some error right there. I don't know. We'll see later on when we're done. If there's anything wrong, it will tell us. Okay, so now I'm done with the dynamic state stuff. Now the vertex input. Now, indeed, this is where you actually configure like how much properties you're going to have in your vertex input stuff, what they are. Are they VEC3, VEC4, or what exactly, and blah, 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 all that, blah, blah, blah. But we don't need it, as you can see here. So, because in fact, we embedded all the vertices data and all that behavior stuff inside of the shaders themselves for now until we actually go to the vertex buffers part okay but now let's make sure to create the vertex input info so let's see vertex uh, uh oh yeah yeah we don't need this anymore now let's actually say vertex input state there you go is equal to what but then i think you have to also say yeah no no it's fine it's fine vertex input state here is say vk pipeline vertex input input state create info there we go dot s type vk Pipeline vertex input state create info. There we go. And the other stuff, I, I don't think I care about it because all of them are zero and all PTR. So we don't need to do that because the initializer already does that for us. All right, lovely. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Next up, let's check the other stuff. Input assembly. Now, this is quite interesting. All right, let's see. Input assembly. .sem Huh. What do you mean? Oh, uh, forgot about that. Okay. Uh, input assembly dot input assembly state. There you go. For such, uh, you know, like two verbose APIs, I like IDEs are really useful. I cannot live without AD. Like IDEs for such verbose APIs, it just makes everything much easier for me. Uh, VK pipeline input assembly state create info. There we go. I think it takes an address, right? Because pointer, right? So S type is equal to VK pipeline. I mean, assembly. There we go. Dot uh, topology. Now this is what's really interesting. Primitive restart is also interesting, but let's go with topology first of all. Now there's a lot of topologies, okay? Um, but I'm gonna try to find something, some good photo or image that to illustrate that. So primitive, or does it talk about that here? No, it doesn't. It just go through it. Um, it just verbally talk about it but anyways so primitive topology i'm gonna go with opengl because the same concept is on opengl and there's a lot of resources for opengl uh, but yeah I'm trying to find some good illustration here um i think this is a good one but it's so small okay let's see if i can there we go this is quite nice all right lovely now there's all of these topologies at least in uh, in opengl but 
the concept is quite the same, although I don't think in Vulcan we have GL quads and GL polygon, but anyways, here I'm just trying to give you the concept. So if you said the topology is points, the GPU will go ahead for each vertex, it will draw a, a point, right? But if you say line strip, it will link the points like this, right? If you say lines, this is what's going to happen. If you say line loop, it's going to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. But then when it reaches here, and like GL line strip, which just stops, here for loop, it's going to go back and link also the first one. Uh, triangle strip, there you go. But this is basically instead of line right now, instead of a line primitive, now you're using a triangle, a filled triangle. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And there you go. And it just goes ahead and fills for you all of that. Now, the thing is, for example, you could have the question is how the GPU does know how much, like for example, for GL points, the fragment shader, I don't think it will run at all because you don't basically you don't, actually you do, right? It will run for the outlines, I think like for the points themselves. I'm not sure to be honest. I never really work with GL points. And so I don't really know for sure. But in any ways, in any ways, uh, there is some property inside of the pipeline that we're going to see later on, which you can actually tell it how big the points will be to the GPU. Okay. Uh, but I think maybe I'm not exactly sure, but maybe if I remember well, you need to actually set uh, you need to actually add the feature inside the device, the device, the Vulcan device, to be able to use that thing. But we'll see later on how it goes. This is for the points. Then there is the lines. You can also do the same thing with the lines where you have a property for line. Mm, I don't know what it's called. Line, line width, right? Line width. Um, by default, it's just one, but like, you can change it as long as you add the feature for that. Uh, that we're going to maybe see later on, but anyways. And here, of course, as you can see, GL line, triangle strip, quad strip. I don't think this is a thing in Vulkan. Uh, I just seen OpenGL, I think. For triangles, there you go. One, two, three, four, five, six. So each three vertices, you have a different... A triangle not like here where you can say one two three four and then you have two triangles but the thing that the catch is that they're always linked they always share one one uh what it's called segment okay well i don't think again it's it's uh possible in vulcan we'll see triangle fan one I, I don't mean that it's not possible to draw quads. It's just not the actual topology here. It's not there, right? But if you want to draw quads in Vulcan, you basically just draw two triangles and there you go. Boom. Um, now, if you're interested into drawing quads, you could probably go with triangle strip instead of triangles because to draw a quad using triangle strip, you only need four vertices, right? But for triangles, you need actually six vertices. And we're going to see later on index buffer, which also makes this uh, even crazier, but we'll see later on. For now, it's fine. Um, but basically what index buffer is, you actually define all of the positions that you'll have, and then using some other array, you tell it which ones to go for. For example, you can go ahead and say, I want to link the third vertex to second vertex, five vertex, stuff like that anyways. And then basically you can reuse, for example, one vertex data, you can use it multiple times in your index buffer. But anyways, uh, later on. And triangle fan, basically you give it the first vertex, which is the center of something, like uh, like one point that is shared by all the triangles that you're going to draw next. Let's say two, uh, here's the second, here's the third, here's the fourth, here's the fifth, there is the sixth. Uh, polygon, I don't think it exists in uh, Vulcan topologies uh, you have to do it yourself using the other primitives um, the the other question that you may ask is since this guy for example GL triangle fan or GL triangle strip since they're always linked uh, right how can I actually make it how can I actually use triangle fan for example and still leave a gap you know like for example leave a gap and just go straight to some somewhere else right how do you do that 
Well, this is where you actually use the uh, the primitive restart. The primitive restart, basically you, you push some vertex that have some special index. Of course, if you're using the index buffer, you have to use the index buffer if you want to use this. And for example, this value, right? And what happens is that the GPU understands that you basically want here to break the geometry apart. Uh, so that's basically it really. Uh, but in our case, we're gonna use GL triangles for simplicity. We're only gonna draw one triangle, so why bother? Um, so yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And this is basically the most used uh, pr like topology, pretty much. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> so now let's actually go back to work, right? Uh, right, 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 right. Now let's see what we have here. Topology, VK, topology, triangles, triangle list. And let's see what topologies we have. Hold control, click. There we go. If you're using a point list, it's zero. And in fact, since it's zero, if you're using a point list, you can just discard the whole topology property. It's gonna be automatically zero anyways, um, which is pointless. And then there is triangle list. And as you notice, there is no Pol polygon topology or quad topology. There's only lines. There's also something called patch, which to be honest, I never used. And I never knew what it is all about. But anyways, there's all this stuff. Nice, nice, nice. Uh, for primitive restart enable, I'm just gonna leave it as false. So I don't need to even set it up because it's by default when you're using the initializer, it's false. Next up, what we have. Uh, let me make sure to add the comma there. There we go. Next up is, let's see what we got here. Viewport and scissors. Let's go. Okay. So we're going to create a viewport. So let's actually add our viewport state. Uh, of course, reference, VK viewport, uh, state, create info pipeline, right? Dot S type. There we go. Is equal to VK, um, viewport state great info there you go and basically we can set the scissors uh list pointer to some array of scissors right and viewport same thing and of course make sure to set the viewport count scissor count and now we can actually do the same thing with this guy we can make basically create an array for that vk viewport uh-huh viewports Although we're gonna have one viewport, but just anyways, uh, VK viewport. So how you do that, you do that like this. Now I can set the X to zero, but since I'm gonna set X and Y to zero, I don't need to even specify them. I only require width, which I'm gonna say is the frame buffer width and height. Now I'm gonna get the swap chain, right? Swap chain width and height, okay, lovely. So how do you get the swap chain within height? Well, we already exposed them in the last video, I think. Um, date swap chain, uh, well, window dot swap chain, right? Dot to, let's see, image extent dot width, let's go. And since I'm gonna use image extent a lot, let's just actually save that guy. All right, so uh, image extent, VK image extent. Is it done like that? Hmm. Image extent, let's go. Is it 2D or something like that? What? VK extent 2D, all right, all right. Not image, okay. All right, image extent is equal to that guy image extent now i can just use image extend directly dot width and in fact for viewports you actually give it float that's why just make sure to cast it dot height same thing with the other guy float image extent uh, dot height 
There we go. And that's the first viewport done. Now let's actually make sure to, to create the scissors too. What's going on with the autocomplete right now, bro? Why it's super broken right now? Bruh. Uh, Vicky. Am I missing something? Hold on a second. Oh, it's Rec 2D. Okay. Ah, uh, mate. Rec 2D. Scissors. <laughs> is equal to an array once again. Let's set up our first scissor offset. I don't care about offset. I only care about extent. Since offset will be 0, 0. Okay. Dot extent. And extent, I think, is VK extent 2D. Or. Right? Yeah, VK extent 2D. So I can just use directly image extent in this case. In like viewports, which are which are floats, uh, you can just use image extent 2D directly. All right, lovely. So we created the scissors and the viewports. Of course, right now I only have one. But anyways. So next up is viewport state now let's make sure in viewport state we set the the stuff that we need so for example viewport count is equal to viewports of course size of viewports i can hard code it but why hard code it if you can just do it that easily like this anyways all right But if you're only interested in one viewport, I just recommend doing it, just hard code stuff. Uh, but if you think in the future you may add more viewports or whatever, and you want to be flexible, so whenever you change that, you make sure that it's changed automatically, like it's dynamic, then make sure to do that. Anyways, uh, viewports, now let's make sure to set the P viewports equal to viewports. And same thing for viewport count, which is equal to the, uh, actually not viewport count, uh, scissor count, okay. Go to size of scissors, divide by size of, you can see there is a lot of <laughs> stuff that you actually do all yourself, like you configure everything. Which is quite nice and bad at the same time, but yeah. So that's pretty much it for the viewports and scissors. We're done with them. Lovely stuff. Next up, what we need. By the way, I didn't still didn't. Uh, I'm just gonna go through real quick. So you can notice here. This is the viewport. This is basic. This is actually the whole the whole window right basically and this is the viewport size extent and stuff okay this is the viewport now this is the scissor now in this case the scissor is larger than the viewport right and so the thing is the the smallest thing out of them will be drawn into the screen right since the viewport is smaller than the scissor then well you're just drawing the thing that you have the viewport on because in fact the viewport is basically defining where you actually draw stuff but notice one thing though, um, that the image right here, you can see the whole thing. You can see the whole thing since the viewport is smaller than the scissor, right? So the viewport, because the viewport actually controls where you actually draw stuff, okay? In this case, the viewport is the same as the, the actual window, right? But the scissor is smaller. Now what happens here, the actual image is drawn into the screen, but it's only one part of it is drawn. So here, instead of squishing it, since the viewport is smaller, no. Here it is drawn fully, but the thing is, you have the scissor, which makes it only draw one part of the screen instead of everything. And this is hopefully what is viewport and scissors. I don't want to spend more time on this uh for now at least later on maybe we can when we have some drawing on i can show you in real time what's going on there we can experiment with that stuff uh but yeah now they're just doing that stuff viewport states 
Now the rasterizer. Okay, rasterizer. As we said, uh, after you're done with the shaders, you're basically have just a bunch of mathematical data, you know, it's like vectorized data, right? But in the rasterization stage, you take that mathematical data and you actually turn it into pixels, individual pixels, right? Individual pixel buffer stuff. Uh, but anyways, anyways, let's actually say rasterizer. Let's make sure comma rasterization state. Pointer to rasterization state. There you go. Now the S type is equal to VK structure type rasterization state. Create info. Let's go. Now, as you can see, here we go. This is the line width that I was talking about. If you're using GL, like not GL, but the the uh, uh, the topology, the line topology, then you can actually set this line width to something other than 1.0. But you can only do that if you have some kind of, uh, you know, some kind of feature enabled by default. Okay. Now, the thing is, even if I'm not using line width, it seems like I have to actually set line width to something other than zero, maybe at least. I will see later on, but just set it to 1.0 for now even if you're not using line stuff. Front face, this is also what I was talking about. Uh, VK front face anti-clockwise. So you can actually use clockwise, right? But I really recommend using counterclockwise. In fact, the tutorial is also using clockwise and I'm not really sure why. I mean, sure you can do it. There's nothing wrong with that, but I really not recommend doing so because the, the convention in even in mathematics, like if you know uh, what he's called, he's you call, yeah Euler, the mathematician Euler. He's even was used anti-clockwise order to define his uh, his triangle vertices. So of course not using Vulcan. I mean just mathematics, right? Um, and also it plays well with a lot of mathematical stuff that we use in in gra like ma graphics math. So I really recommend using counterclockwise instead of clockwise, although you can actually do clockwise with no problem. <laughs> but anyways, call mode is equal to VK. And also, by the way, if you choose to use clockwise, then you have to actually go into your shaders and make sure the order is actually inverse. Like you should do something like this, right? Um, no, but anyways, we don't care about that stuff now. Uh, all right, nice, nice, nice. By the way, I'm gonna remove that A at the SPV. I don't need it anymore. Okay, we can do later on some some Python script or even some Rust something or whatever uh, that actually goes ahead and and compiles uh, that for us, to compile the shaders for us, you know, like automatically. But for now, I don't care. <laughs> Let's just keep it simple. Make it call mode front a bit. Now this is call mode, basically you tell the Vulkan or the GPU, right? Uh, which faces you want to draw. Now the thing is, as a beginner, I would actually recommend using VK call mode front and back at first, just in case of, in case of you somehow um, ruined the order of the vertices, you know, like where is it? The, like in case of you actually didn't do a correct order of the vertices, you're still going to have something drawn into your screen instead of just a black screen without you knowing anything about why that happening. Um, uh, but if you, if you know what you're doing later on after you, uh, like maybe even after you're done with all this stuff, you can actually set back the call mode to call mode front because it's much more optimized since so you don't have to waste uh, by drawing a second triangle for no reason. Uh, or I mean another face for no reason. Okay, so yeah, front bit. But I'm just going to use front bit because I'm kind of, uh, uh, you know, like optimistic about that I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Although not really knowing what I'm doing exactly. But anyways, uh, you can take the adventure like me, but in any way, if you do this, if you use the front bit, and if you don't see anything drawn into the screen, then you may actually 
uh, be suspicious about this call mode. Make sure to set it to something else and and see if it, if it will if it's the problem or not. But anyways, uh, call mode. After that, what we have the polygon mode, which is VK. You can say fill polygon mode fill. Now the thing is there is multiple ways of filling the poly like not filling but uh, basically there's multiple polygon modes even in OpenGL right of course and if you go to let's see uh, uh, Blender I'm going to show you an illustration here it's called wireframe okay wireframe wireframe versus render Hopefully I can find some really nice illustration that shows exactly what's going on. Um, all right, there we go. Okay. We have something here at least. So this is the, 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 what is it called? Wireframe, right? The, and what is it? Polygon mode line so you can actually set the polygon mode to line point fill fill rectangle nv but notice the nv here which means that this is only possible in nvidia but it also means that you have to actually add an extension or a feature or whatever to actually be able to use that one and you have to to have you know an nvidia gpu so uh, polygon mode xt dynamic state you can also make this polygon mode uh, dynamic state by, I think, using... Really? No. No, no, no. Actually, yeah, you can, right? You can actually set it in the dynamic state, right? And then you can easily change it. But this is an extension. And EXT means that it's supported by multiple vendors, right? And not just NVIDIA, for example. Uh, but yeah, for now, I'm just going to use a polygon mode fill. But let me actually demonstrate to you what that means. So, for example, here, this guy right here, this mesh, it's called the Suzanne monkey, I think, or chimpanzee, or I don't know. <laughs> Either way, um, this is the, the wireframe mode. Uh, it's called that in most... Uh, software right in 3d modeling software but in uh, here it's called vk polygon mode line okay this is vk polygon mode fill so you actually go ahead you actually fill those polygons with colors and stuff okay and like the uh in like the other way okay anyways Anyways, anyways, anyways. So, for example, if you're creating Blender in the future, <laughs> just know that you can actually uh, do this by, for example, make uh, making multiple pipelines, one that have the polygon mode line and the other have fill. Then you can easily switch between those two pipelines uh, whenever the user wants to. Uh, or maybe you can use that extension that I that you've seen there and to actually set it as a dynamic state and then easily just use one pipeline and then basically have it done on multiple ones. I'm not exactly sure, but I think if you if you said instead of mode fill and said you used line or point, I think you don't need the fragment shader. But I don't know, to be honest. I'm not sure. Maybe the fragment shader only runs on those lines. I, I have to I make sure in the... In, after finishing this video, I'm going to make sure that's the case or whatever. Um, anyways, so I think that's probably everything we need here. There's rasterizer, rasterizer discard enable, which we don't have to care about right currently. But uh, actually... As you can see, this is useful in some special cases like shadow maps, uh, but it only it also requires a GPU feature to be turned on in the device if you want to actually use this. Uh, set this to true. So since it's false, well, it's zero, which means we don't have to, to specify it. Line width, as you can see, one point zero f. As you can see, the maximum line width that is supported depends on the hardware and any line thicker than 1.0F requires you to enable the wide lines GPU feature. Oh, interesting. So I think if you, you can actually set something other than 1.0, like maybe 0.0, .0 or something that is lesser. But if you want to use more than that, you probably have to, to, to set the GPU feature wide lines. 
to add it okay the call mode the front face as you can see somehow the tutorial used the clockwise and i don't understand it i mean it's a kind of like an official tutorial so it have to to use some good you know some good standard uh, options but anyways anyways the, uh, i think there's probably some reason for that but anyway depth bias enable uh huh i don't care about the other stuff all right fine now multi sampling okay let's add the multi sampling too all right a lot of stuff as you notice here uh comma multi sampling there we go uh, bk multi sampling now, of course you don't have to actually remember all of this you know <laughs> You could always have some reference like a tutorial or the documentation or the specs or whatever. Uh, you just don't need to remember this. And in fact, in your in an actual application, you probably have to deal with this stuff just in the start when you set up and you stuff up. But later on, you know, you're just not gonna care about it anymore. Anymore, so yeah. Uh, multiple states. So don't be overwhelmed by all of these properties. You just set it once and goodbye. Of course, if you create you want to create more pipelines, you're gonna have to do the same thing once again. <laughs> Anyways, uh, you can also make your own wrappers. Um, but yeah. Sample shading enabled alpha two. What? Rasterization samples. So we're not we don't care about multi assembly right now. In fact. So let's say S type first of all, VK multi sample. There we go. Dot. Okay, let's see what we have. So as you can see, it's setting everything to null, 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 null. Optional also. So I only care about rasterization samples. I should make sure that it's VK sample count one bit because I'm not using any multi sampling. We're gonna cover maybe multi sampling hopefully in the future. Uh, for now, let's not care about it. But multi sample, let me actually show you just just like uh, an illustration of what multi sampling is. MSAA zero versus. I don't know, 8x or something like that. Hopefully I find a good one. Okay, something that really shows the NGL is in really well. There we go, okay. I think this one is good. All right, nice. So notice this guy right here, open image new tab, please. All right, notice. So this is no MSAA, okay? Although it's using CSAA, but anyway, we don't, I'm just worried about like, I just want to show you the concept. I don't care about which, because there's multiple techniques of multi-assembly. That's why there's CSSA, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, all that stuff. But we only care about the concept here. Now this is where we don't have any multi-sampling at all. Uh, you can basically, if you zoom in well enough, you can see that there's ridged, it's like you know each pixel is like either black or it's so sharp basically but msaa makes it so it's so smooth like this and so it's much nicer on the eyes and it just makes it much smoother even if you have like less pixels and stuff and of course the more resolution you have like the, the pixel density the smaller the pixel in your screen the less you need the ms the multi-sampling and by the way, what multi-sampling does basically, in fact, it basically, uh, so I have full HD, right? But instead of rendering all of that graphics in HD, no, it goes full HD. It goes ahead and renders it into 4K. Then it, it multi-sample it, like each pixel gets four samples from that 4K image and it smooths those samples around. So like, you get four pixels from 4K, you you interpolate them, right? So as to smooth them, you average them, and then you give the color to the... But we'll see later that on more. I, I just want you to know what is that for anyways. I, I don't really 
Uh, and I can show you also, hopefully, if we go to multi-sampling here, I can find really nice one. Okay, let's go. All right, let's go. Let's go. This is really nice. So this is single sampling, as you can notice here. Um, and whenever this, the shape, right, the, the primitive is inside of the center of the pixel, as you can see, it gets filled on. Otherwise, it gets filled nothing. Now, here is how multi-sampling works. Now, each pixel you actually sample, in this case, it's MSAA4, which means we sample each pixel, there is four places. It's not just the center place, but there's four places in the pixel itself. And dependent on how much pixels are actually turned on, for example, here uh, in this pixel, for example, there is the four samples, all of them are on which gives us, you know, a full color, right? But, uh, like, let me show you, as you can see here, four samples, right? This guy right here is only one sample that is turned on, but these three samples aren't turned on, so you get this little op opacity, right? For example, this guy, three samples are on, but one is outside of the shape, so you get something along the line, you know, it's more opaque, right? It's less transparent. But, but hopefully that that takes the point across, but this is basically what it takes to actually enable that multi-sampling that we're going to see later on. All right, this is a really nice example. Okay, this is a really nice example. Let's see. So this is without multi-sampling. Notice the, the, the really sharp edges. I'm not sure if it shows with the YouTube compression, but there's some really sharp edges around the sh the, the whole mesh, right? But then we enable multi-sampling, it's so smooth silky smooth uh, but of course that msaa8 and of course msaa multi sampling is really expensive uh, in fact uh, msaa4 is not just double expensive of msaa2 it's actually not a linear relationship at least if i remember well it's probably some kind of you know uh like what can i say like exponential relationship uh, so it's really, really, um, because in fact, why it's exponential since you're making the image bigger, but not bigger in just in one dimension, but in fact, in two dimensions. And of course, this is just MSAA, one technique, but there's also other techniques that doesn't rely on actually rendering to a bigger image than multi-sampling it down to one image, resolving it, it's called. Uh, uh, but anyways... Hopefully that takes the point across. Notice here, hopefully this is much more nicer to look at. Okay, lovely. So there's also another one which is called sample shading, which we're not going to care about right now. Anyways, but this is basically for shader sampling that we're going to see later on. Right now, we don't, we don't have any shaders, shaders, uh, shader sampling for textures, so we don't care about this right now. Um, but anyway, hopefully that just gives you, you know, an idea about what's possible. Right. Make a sample count one bit. And by the way, I think count one bit, let's see. Samples. Rasterization samples. Make a sample count one bit. Let me see how much that is. It's one, okay. So I cannot actually discard it. It's, since it's one, it's not zero, all right. Okay, nice, 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 nice. That's pretty much all I need the multi-sampling. And by the way, there's also that sample shading stuff, I think, there you go, but I don't care about it. So, what we have next? I would love if the IDE would have just, you know, uh, only shown me the stuff that I didn't already tell it. Or is it really doing it already? Hold on a second. No, it's not doing it, right, as you can see, but it would have been really cool. By the way, if someone is using C-Line and have some tips for me, let me know, please. And uh, thank you. Right, depth and stencil testing, color blending. We don't care about depth and stencil testing for now. Uh, color blending. All right, color blending is the one that I was talking about when you have two fragments on the same pixel, uh, like two fragments from different triangles, for example. Then how do you decide which one gets drawn into that pixel or how they contribute together if there is transparency? Well, this is where you configure it, right? And to be honest, I don't want to go through this like too much, I think. Uh, 
Actually, let's just do that. Anyway, since we're here anyways, let's just do it, all right? Fine. <laughs> VK pipeline color blend attachment state. Uh, just for the sake of completeness, color blend state. Uh, because I hate when, like personally, I hate when tutorials just go as I had through a lot of stuff. I'm uh, just telling you, just forget about it. <laughs> I mean, that results in a much shorter tutorials, but again, it just, at least it's so annoying for me. But anyways, uh, VK pipeline color blend state. Of course, I'm doing the same thing for some things, but some things are just so far away. It's not like something that is really, uh, but anyway, 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 attachment count, attachment. What it's talking about? Oh. Um, okay, let's see what we have here. So we have color blend attachment state. Okay, okay. Let's see. We have P attachment count, attachment count, we have P attachments. All right, so the thing is you could have different um, like color blending states because in fact later on you're gonna see that we're not gonna have one frame buffer and a frame buffer is kind of like you can think about it just like a render target in some sense although that's not the complete uh, it, like image of how to think about it but uh, yeah blend constants logic op enable Mm hmm color blended there we go color blending of course let's for not forget about this type and hold on a second i'm gonna pause i'm just gonna remove it's too hot here okay back 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 all right s type is equal to vk pipeline color blend state There we go. And that's the S type. Next thing is the attachment count. Now, since we have attachment counts and stuff like that, I'm going to have the attachments outside of here. Okay. It's going to say VK attachment. Uh, I need to make sure which attachment it's talking about, to be honest. Hold on a second. Yeah, it's called uh, pipeline color blends to attachment C because there's our uh, like. Uh, another type of attachment that we're going to see later on with the render pass, but right now let's just mm -hmm. VK pipeline color blend attachment state. So color blend attachment states, right? There we go. Equal to that. There you go. Now here I can, do I need S-type? No, I don't. All right, pretty cool stuff. Now let's me actually uh, pass that stuff into there. The color blend, uh, dot blend, no, attachments, I mean, attachment count. Size of attachment states, there you go. Uh -huh. Divided, I mean, divided by size of color blend attachment states and there you go next up is p attachments which is basically color blend attachment states and next up is uh, blend the constants now these are some constants that are you know like constant on all of the attachments and stuff uh, that are the same on all the attachments so right here it's setting it to zero it's optional so we don't care okay next up is logic op enable it's false so we don't care okay yeah pretty much that's all we need just set the attachments and there you go nice so i don't even have to specify this stuff for now let's just skip around it now we need to make sure to create our attachment. 
In fact, we're only gonna have one attachment, so we don't we only need one color blend attachment, I think. So blend enable. Do you want to enable blending or not? This is uh this is actually what you gotta do if you want transparency, which is basically lurping between the for RGB you lurp the colors between the, the first like one color and the second uh right using the alpha but for the alpha you just leave it as it is for the you basically take the the new alpha okay um but in our case we're just gonna we don't care about transparency right now so we're gonna use this guy so let's start by color right mask color right mask now this is basically you tell it which components you want to write to Okay, so let's say vacay color components are, we need G, we need B and A, all of them basically. Uh, oh yeah, I missed the, uh, the, the green, right? Interesting. You don't have to specify them in this order, which is for, uh, you know, convention. Color right mask, color blend OP. Now let's see the other stuff. Now I like the way of this author of this tutorial actually added uh, a pseudocode for this stuff, which is really useful. So basically here, if blend enable, you do this operation stuff. Now this whole configuration stuff is just how you actually tell the GPU which operations to do one of these of these guys, right? Instead of coding it yourself. Um, since blending is kind of like a fixed state, I think, yeah, because you don't, you cannot really create a shader to do it, right? I think. Uh, Although you can actually do manually the blending in the shaders, uh, maybe. But you just fake blending, right? But anyway. Um, now, if blend enable, I don't care. I don't. I didn't enable blend. So what's going to happen is it's going to say final color equal to new color. So basically, the last guy will take the new color, the, the color. That's it. And here we're saying add color right mask. So what that means that... If you don't, didn't set color R, G, and B, and A, so basically you're not gonna draw anything, you're not gonna blend anything. The the initial color will stay as it is because, well, you didn't write to any components. Uh, that's why here I'm making sure to draw to all the components so it's all drawn into the screen. Okay, color right mask. And I think that's pretty much all you need. I mean, as long as you say blend enable equal VK false, Right, and all, as you can see, they're all optional, right? So, you know what? Let's just skip over this stuff for now. But uh, you can learn a lot about this in here. I think this uh, this piece of uh, the tutorial is really perfect, especially if you analyze this uh, pseudocode that you put here. That's just perfect. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, we don't need any of that. Just make sure to set the color mask right there. And there you go. There you go, there you go, there you go. Now that's the color blend state. Now the pipeline layout. Now the pipeline layout is actually created and destroyed. Now we don't really care much about the pipeline layout. So this is basically uh, relevant to, to the layout of your vertex data, right? For example, if you're using a vertex buffer, etc., we don't care about that. Here, since we're embedding the, the vertex data inside of the shader themselves again, um, but it requires you to actually create it anyways. All right, so let's do that. Let's do that. Let's do that. Dot pipeline. Would have been really useful if the IDE were to filter all of the stuff that we that we already have specified that we already have set. That would have been really cool. But anyways, um, vertex inputs to what it's called layout. Okay, 
there we go, layout, equal to, now, I can maybe create it here though, I mean, but I have to check the errors and stuff, uh, no, I'd rather not do it here, let's just say, this is the pipeline layout, and, I'm not sure if you actually supposed to destroy this after the graphics pipeline. Right? Not sure, but let's just do that stuff right now anyways. Let's see what's gonna happen. So, Vicky, pipeline, layout, layout. Like uh, generally, uh, I just destroyed the, the 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 layout after destroying the pipeline. You know, it's like just at the end of the application. But I'm not exactly sure if you can do that. Like uh, destroy just like like destroy shader module. Like just after you create the pipeline, you're done. Um, but let's see. Let's see what's gonna happen here. Vacate pipeline layout. We have the layout right, and then let's actually. Oh, uh, yeah, layout, uh -huh. layout, pipeline, out. Right, let's make sure I'm certain it right. And let's try to expect VK create a pipeline layout. To be honest, I'm also not sure why it has to be created exactly instead of uh, just putting it inside of there. But Anyway, um, maybe creating pipeline layout is kind of expensive. That may be the case. I don't know. Um, so anyway, stage context device. Or maybe it could help because, in fact, you could reuse the same pipeline layout for different pipelines. I'm going to actually research further about this, you know, when, when this video ends, hopefully. Uh, anyway, VK pipeline. I just wanted to not leave you wait a lot until I'm um, researched everything. Type structure type. All right. There you go. Pipeline layout create info. Set layout count. Now, since again we have this layout count and push constant range and all that stupid stuff, let's actually do them in their own. Uh, let's give them their own rights. VK pipeline layout. No, what we need, what we need, what we need, uh, we need the descriptor sets. Oh, since we're not put, putting any, we're not using any of these currently. Let's just uh, let's just ignore this for now, okay? Just make sure to add the, the S type. All right, there you go, and hopefully it should be fine. And let's make sure to add the R arguments allocator. So state config allocator pipeline layout. And uh, now for the pipeline layout, we're just going to give it the address for the pipeline layout in this case. Too few, par uh, few arguments provided to function. Do I need some other stuff? Or what? Oh yeah, format. Oh yeah, right. Couldn't create pipeline layout. There we go. Uh... One thing that I remembered is here. Yeah, I forgot to actually set the to change the error. Okay, lovely. All right, so I think hopefully right now we're done, really. Yeah, I think so. We're done. Let me see. Uh, by the way, let's try to actually see what's going to happen after we destroy the, uh, the pipeline layout just after creating the pipeline. Let's see. I rendered a... Uh, no, uh, context, device, pipeline layout. And state allocator.
There we go. Let's go. Oh my god. That was crazy. But this is by far the most verbose part, I think, of the, the whole tutorial, if I remember well. Uh, of course, there's still a lot to do, but... But yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyways. They get destroyed by blind line. Now, let's try this if this works. Why couldn't create graphics pipeline? Probably missed something, right? Oh yeah, it's just uh, yeah, it's just talking about the the fragment shader breaker. Okay, it's just need it's need it needs the render pass, right? Let's actually create the render pass now, it's not too much, although I don't think I'm gonna really explain it a lot in this part. I kind of tired already, <laughs> but maybe, hold on, let me see. Mm. Destroy pipeline layouts. Uh, you know what? Uh, we're not gonna do the for at least for the pipeline layout. I'm not gonna destroy it for now. I don't know if that's the case, but just to be safe though, instead of doing this, I'm just gonna put it in the render itself, just like the other tutorial does it. Okay. Render dot pipeline graphics pipeline layout. Or just call it pipeline layout, you know. Anyway. Create new field. Make it pipeline layout. There you go. And now, instead of doing this, I have to say state render dot pipeline layout. By the way, I only destroyed one shader module. I have to destroy the second too. Fragment shader module, and of course, let's make sure to... After destroying the pipeline, I think, destroy the pipeline layout. Because it's no longer used. Here we got a passing in. The device, next is the... Line layout. And next up is the allocator. Alrighty, so there we go. Now we pretty much just need the render pass. This is why we have this kind of errors that you couldn't create graphics pipeline. Um, I think I'm just gonna leave it for the next video because I'm probably not gonna give it its right right now. <laughs> so yeah, it's, render pass is kind of simple to make as you can see here, but it needs some a lot of explanation <laughs> to understand a render pass. So for now, this is it for this video. I think. Uh, please, if you if you encounter any error or you think something is wrong, let me know in the comment section. I'm also a beginner. Um, just trying to help as much as possible um, and trying to explain things that I didn't understand at first, you know, or, or took me a long time or whatever, but it, you know, anyways. Um, so that's basically it, hopefully, for this video. And so, yeah, see you later. Goodbye, everyone.